Okay, so I think before we go into to talk to Robert, I think um, if we can just bring up the disclaimer very quickly, just to, to, to go over that. Okay, so anything that, that I say, and obviously most importantly, anything that Robert says should be considered general in nature, should be should not be considered personal advice in any capacity. Any views that we say, um, I say, will not represent my employer. And so there, please just take two seconds to, to have a look at the disclaimer. Um, okay, let's bring it on. Um, Robert, welcome to the program. Thank you for being very generous of your time today. Um, oh, you know, I've, I've seen... Uh, yeah, a few webinars that you've been in before. It's all webinars these days, I suppose. Back in the day, you probably did some live presentations. Um, I've looked at some of your books, and we'll go over one of those in a second. I've talked about, um, you know, your blog and various factors. But um, why don't you just tell us a bit more about, you know, I've probably given you given quite a bit away now, but why don't you just tell about uh, about your involvement in the systematic and algorithmic space? Crikey. Um, so my involvement started a about 20 years ago um, when I was um, university and I, I did an internship for a, a large quant fund called uh, AHL. Um, and then after graduating, I actually went and did something a bit different. I, I went to work in an investment bank for a couple of years where I was doing kind of more sort of a kind of standard trader job, if you like. I was trading uh, interest rate derivatives for them. Um, and um, and then I did something after a couple of years, and, and then I was kind of looking around for something to do again. And um, this this job advert came up for this same firm again, AHL, um, and um, they were looking for somebody with very almost exactly my background, so someone with kind of financial markets experience, with you know with a degree in uh, economics and with a you know the ability to sort of code at a reasonably high level. So. Uh, I went went back and interviewed with them, and uh, was was lucky enough to to get a job working for them, starting um, oh, way back in two thousand and six. Now, so quite some time ago. Um, so yeah, I did a couple of things for them. I ran their global um, systematic global macro strategy for a couple of years, um, and then I, I I basically got promoted to manage their fixed income book, which was a very large uh, portfolio of um, systematic fixed income trading. Yeah. Um, I did that till 2013, um, and uh, since then I've I've been uh, just trading my own money. So I've gone from the billions to the sort of numbers that most of the people listening to this are probably um, kind of more comfortable with. Um, so you know, from billions to hundreds of thousands, basically. Um, so my, I'm basically a retail trader now, um, but um, I've also been trying to kind of share my my knowledge and experience by, as you say, write, writing some books, doing a bit of blogging, uh, a bit of bit of university lecturing. Um, yeah, so uh, the way I like to explain it is I kind of do all the stuff I used to enjoy about my old job, but none of the boring stuff like, you know, going to going to endless meetings and, and yeah, uh, yeah. having to try and sell sell products to clients uh, and, and so on. So so I just do the cool stuff, the research stuff and the and, and try and share share my findings with other people. When you were trading fixed income for the bank and I used to I was on I was in fixed income myself back in London at uh, Merrill Lynch Investment Managers. It wasn't really much automated back then, but you were doing exotic derivatives at some stage, I guess. And um, I think, and and how did you find yourself going, you know what, I, I just think that this world should be automated. I'm better off being automated. Um, I, you know, I want to move away from making decisions. I'm just, that's just not me. That's not my circumstance. It's not who I am. How, how did you get into that space? How did you realize that that was the way you were going? Well, very quickly, <laughs> yeah, because I don't know about you, but I personally found working uh, as a, you know, I, I guess you could describe it as a discretionary rather than a systematic trader. Personally found that way too much like stress and hard work. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just, you know the, the idea of having a computer do everything for you um strikes me as a, a much uh, more efficient uh, more relaxing way of life definitely um and also I, I personally believe that there probably are people out there who are you know incredibly good traders and who can do much better at trading than the sort of systems that i'm running can do um but i'm not one of those people um and you know i, th I completely accept that i'm not cut out for trading both from a I guess you could say from an emotional perspective um, and a stress management perspective but also you know I just think that the, the number of people it's my personal opinion the number of people who can actually beat a simple trading system is, is relatively small and most people would be better off just using a system to trade which of course you could do so in an automated fashion 
Um, yeah. I was going to say as well, I mean, have you ever got any, when you were, when you were in, still in that sort of discretionary, semi-discretionary stage, um, you know, being an example where volatility is kicked up or, or you, you know, volatility is sustained for a period of time. And you said, I just can't be in that world. I can't take the trades. I, you know, I take my position size down. Um, whereas your automated system now, your systematic strategy would just take the trade because of, you know, whatever the set of rules that are, are, are being triggered. But back in the day when you were discretionary, you know, was there examples of where you, you, you wanted to take the trade, but you just couldn't do it because of a, you know, the, 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 the volatility of the market? And and you look back now and you say, yeah, if I've been systematic, I would have just done so much better in that situation. I can actually give you a perfect example of that. And it's actually from when I was working at AHL. So I was actually working systematic trading. But my own trading of my own personal portfolio was completely discretionary and, and frankly, a mess, actually. <laughs> uh, and that was because, you know, I didn't I didn't have much time to spend on it. Obviously, I had a full time job. Um, you know, and um, I, I think I also, because I had Bloomberg screens in front of me, I think sometimes that could be a disadvantage in terms of having too much information. Um, and yeah, I wasn't kind of emotionally in, in, a, in a good place in terms of trading. And, and it was uh, a very specific example, which was in early 2009. Um, I actually made a decision to buy some um, UK banking shares. Um, and, uh, you know, in retrospect, it was a perfect trading decision. I think I would have bought specifically Barclays, um, within about 2% of the bottom and subsequently sold them within about 10% of the top. And, and I would have made a, a, slight, a six-fold increase in my capital. So it would have been, you know, the ultimate trade, really. Um, but when it actually came to pulling the trigger, I panicked. Um, you know, the, mar the market was in a very volatile state and, and I, I just couldn't bring myself to commit that, that capital, that trade. And I, I ended up putting the trade on, but, but in a much, much smaller size than I'd originally intended to. Mm. So, yeah, that, that's, that's whereas, you know, if I've been, tra been trading systematically and automated, that trade would have just happened. I, you know, it would have just happened automatically and, and um, the, um, the system would have, would have completely ignored the fact that the world was ending. <laughs> Obviously, you know, ma made the decision to adjust the, the risk appropriately because the market was volatile, but, but it would have, you know, put the trade on in the, the correct size um, and just, just ignore all the emotion. And that was something that I, I can't even do now. I certainly couldn't do back then. I think I've got, you know, I've got a similar situation. I think it was the, the 23rd of March of 2020 and everything yeah. was saying, Chris, buy the market, buy the market, buy the S&P. Um, S&P futures got down to, I think, 2177. There was blood on the street. Where people were talking about closing the markets. It wasn't even banning short selling. It was closing the markets. And um, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't buy. And then, of course, you know, you missed out on a, a substantial rally. And it was still, you know, even to this day, people hate the rally, right? So you just, so your system would have bought, you know, you would have made money. But I think that's one of the benefits that, that we talk to people about being um, systematic is that you, you just don't, you just take all that noise out of the equation. I want to talk about you as an individual um, before we start getting into the systems and system design and the mistakes that people make, specifically around retail as well. But I want to understand, you know, you've, you've, you've lectured, you've educated, you've, you've, you've worked with many, many people, but you're, you come from an academic background. Um, how much do you have? I'm, I'm making a judgment. So. <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell, me on, carry on. tell me about your academic background. And do you believe with the right ethos uh, and hard work that anyone bec can become uh, profitable algorithmic traders? Um, the, the reason I was, smiling when you said that about the academic background is you, you've got to bear in mind that I was working in an industry where pretty much everyone I was working with had a had a PhD yeah um, and I would say was definitely better educated and almost certainly smarter than I was so um, so I, I find it a bit embarrassing to be held up as this kind of sort of you know mad professor kind of person when, <laughs> when actually a lot a lot most people work, working in the the systematic and algo trading industry are you know levels above me but anyway um, yeah, so I, I guess the the inference from your question is: Do you need to have a certain kind of academic background to succeed in algorithmic trading, or can, is it just enough to to, as you say, to work to work hard? And and I, no, I don't think you you do need necessarily to have the that academic background. I mean, um, what you you know you you what, what having the academic background helps me with is um, in terms of 
a, a sort of it gives me a philosophy a way of thinking about how i do things like fit trading systems and it gives me um a respect for things like um you know uncertainty and, and the amount of randomness in the markets and things like that um and yeah it gives me some some tools i guess that, that i could use, apply to kind of quantify and deal with those things um, but on the other hand, these are kind of tools and methodologies that anyone can find on the internet, right? And I would say, as long as you've got kind of sort of high, you know, high school maths, secondary school maths, you know, that, that's probably going to be enough in, in the vast majority of cases. Um, you know, if if you do have a, a kind of basic understanding of statistics and probability theory, for example, that is going to help quite a bit in terms of understanding what you, you, you know, how far you can push when you're fitting, say, fitting a trading system. Mm um but 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 it you know you don't necessarily need to have that um and in fact um i would say that some of the um i want to say worse but some of the kind of um dodgiest um kind of fitting of trading systems that i've seen happen has often been done by people who are academically very overqualified so you know they've got phds and potentially even postdocs but don't have necessarily much market experience and also so they, they kind of fall in love with their model. They fall in love with the the idea that the model is right, and they haven't got the the, um, the the there is the respect for the uncertainty of the market. So, so that there's kind of you know I'm not saying it that if you if you're superly overqualified you can't make money in the markets. Of course, there are funds that only employ people who are academically brilliant and make a lot of money. I'm thinking, of, for example, of Renaissance Technology in the US. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, you know, it's certainly the case that. One of the most dangerous things in the world is someone who's got a phd and a piece of machine learning software and some financial market data um you know a lot of those people will, will end up um making a, a a bit of a mess of what they're doing and often it's helpful if if they you know they they can get some market experience or learn from people with market experience before they actually try implementing their models yeah it's interesting i mean we can go over the indicators and various factors um but let's start with a blank canvas let's let's start with um the initial point of design and and let's talk chicken and egg because where do you start is it the idea of you know what i want to create a, a series of systems um but i want to start with with a with a mean reversion system i you know i found myself counter trending the market a lot i like the idea of, of of buying weakness and selling strength but i want to do it in a more systematic and scientific fashion you know, maybe I'll I'll get into some diversification and I'll buy some, you know, design some momentum strategies. But immediately, I'm thinking of the the system that I want to design and the out and and what goes into that. Or do I take the other factor, where I could say, you know what, I'm I'm, I'm I come from a data world. I'm going to do some data mining and then do it the opposite way. Using your, you know, how how have you found it? Is there a right or wrong, or is there a better or worse scenario there? So both of those approaches can work. Um, they tend to be, they can be suited to different people. So someone who's got, say, market experience, but less experience, you know, less academic experience would probably want to implement an idea they already have. Whereas someone who's got, you know, a lot of academic experience, but less market experience would probably want to, you know, mine the data and find the system and do, do it that way around. Um, so there are advantages and disadvantages to both approaches. Um, the, the the main disadvantage of the the second approach, which is to start with the data and find the system, is it can be a lot more prone to overfitting or curve fitting. Mm. You're you're much more likely to um, find um, you know something in there that's not really there and actually fit your model too closely to the past data and then have something that doesn't work robustly out of sample. Um, that's less likely if you if you start with a you know building say a mean reversion system. Um, because you know you 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 kind of you limit your limit you know you 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 can you can even go to the extreme of saying actually I don't even need to fit this thing. If you believe that mean reversion works at a particular market, particular time frame, then you can just construct an indicator that will pick up mean reversion, um, and then and then just use it even without any further fitting or, or calibrating. Um, and actually, one thing that people get quite hung up on is finding the perfect indicator. Um, so, you know, there, there are probably, uh, you know, at least m- as many ways of calculating, say, mean reversion as there are people doing mean reversion trading. There are definitely as many ways of calculating momentum as there are ways of doing momentum trading. But actually, it doesn't really matter. Most sensible indicators for a particular style of trading are going to be fairly correlated with each other, are going to do similar things. So it doesn't matter, you know, 
what you don't necessarily need to try and tweak and tweak and fit and fit and fit and try and get that that indicator to be perfect. If you start with the premise that yeah, mean reversion, right, and do something simple, you know, it's all I'm, I need some simple way of saying well, what's the kind of equilibrium level of the market below which I'd buy and above which I'd sell, and you could do something like use I don't know a very slow moving average for example to pick that up, um, or you know a regression line or something like that, and then and then basically you, you've you've got your system straight away, which is you know if, if you're if your price is above that line, sell and and vice versa, and and then that that's the system, and you can try and refine it and, and do variations on it, but but you know there's a danger in in sort of overfitting that, I would say. Mm. And how do you start off? So let's say you, you you've you've now gone to the point of of saying I'm going to I'm going to start with the indicators. I've been I've been a classic technical analyst, uh, you know, discretionary technical analyst for you know for a number of years. I know what a, an RSI, I know what the oscillators do, I know what Bollinger bands do. I understand the deviations and working with a skew uh, in that situation. Now I want to to automate it. Um, is it is it really a question of um, trying one indicator? Per you know what it does, you know RSI. I'm not going to use an RSI and a, and a stochastic together. I'm not going to use a Keltner band and a Bollinger band together, for example. They kind of do similar things. Is it a question of of, of doing one, um, combing it with an oscillator, or is there a you know is there too many indicators that when you're starting out that you you keep it simple and then build it up, or are you if you build it up, are you then subject to curve fitting? I'm definitely a fan of keeping it simple. Um, and, I'll, and I'll be completely honest with you, because I don't come from a, a discretionary technical analysis background, almost all the words you just said, I don't understand. Um, but, <laughs> so, I mean, I've heard of some of them, but if, if you asked me to define what um, the, the, the Bollinger thing was, for example, I, I, I couldn't do it. Um, but so I, I'd, I'd start with whichever of those things you said was the simplest, I'd probably start with that. Um, and I would even potentially just start trading with that so i i do believe if the anyone who's doing anything should start with the simplest thing possible and then try and make it more and more difficult um so um you know for example you know probably a poor analogy but if if you're uh, if you're going to sort of try building a house you probably want to start by learning some brick laying and building a little wall <laughs> yeah, so you don't want to you don't want to be you know going in straight away and, and, and getting a jcb and start digging foundations and putting up some kind of incredibly complicated steel frame building certainly when you when you start trading i believe you should start really simple start with just one indicator and one instrument get get comfortable with the behavior of that as a system and then only think about subsequently adding more indicators and or more instruments um and um you know the the so pick something simple something simple that, that that you understand how it works you understand intuitively what it's doing um so for example you know for me personally something like i know the price minus a moving average as a, as a method for determining mean reversion I, I think that's pretty simple to be honest um i i, I I'd gamble that I could explain that to someone who didn't know anything about trading more quickly than you could explain Bollinger Bands. I would expect. Yeah, I, I, but I anyway, I'm not having a go specifically at Bollinger Bands, but you know. Um, so, um, so, so that I'd start with something fairly simple. Um, and the way I personally like to build, <coughs> sorry, the way I personally like to build my systems is to have a collection of really simple things, um, rather than have say one thing that's very complicated that tries to to sort of tie all those things together if you like in a, in a probably in a quite a non messy non-linear way so to give you simple examples suppose you had i don't know three different kinds of indicators um potentially you can get into this thing where you have this rule that says something like well i'm going to buy if this indicator is here and this indicator is here but not if this indicator is here and so on and so forth you have these very non-linear messy things Whereas the, the way my systems work is much more simple, which is to say, well, basically each of the indicators tells me how confident they are about the trend or the mean reversion. And then I take a, an average of those and that gives me my overall position long or short and, and also the, the strength of that position, if you like. Um, and that, that approach um, makes it less likely you're going to overfit. And it also means that Although the system overall may behave in quite a complex way, I can understand how each of those little things is behaving just by sort of diving into my my code and doing some some back testing of that. Just say just that indicator by itself. Do you think that there's a 
I've got one question um, about how you do you create your own indicators. But before you answer that one, um, I want to answer the idea of: Do you think systems can be too simple? Do you think that they, you can oversimplify them? Do you think that you, you, you talk about sim, uh, systems being simple and you like to keep things? Is there a case for things being just that little bit too simple, though? Um, potentially, yes. Um, so, um, for example, in, in my third book, Leverage Trading, the chapter six is called The Simple System. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you you could argue it's not that simple because it already takes five chapters to get to explain, you know, to get to it. Right. So so um, so it, my idea is simple. It, it potentially isn't that simple, actually. Um, so um, the, the, there are things that, for example, an example of too simple would be always using the same stop loss or always having the same position size. So always say, if you say, I'm always going to commit 1% of my capital tool to a position, or I'm always going to set my stop loss at a particular level, that's too simple because it, it's not properly accounting for the, the different risk that different markets have and the different amount of time you want to, might want to hold a position. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, so you, you can get things that are too simple. Um, but so and that, but that's sort of not really around the indicators. That's around the position and risk management side of mm -hmm. things, right? In terms of actually, the indicators themselves, I, I would argue they should be as simple as possible. Um, but, you know, and, 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 and normally the only reason I'd make an indicator more complicated would be to not improve its profitability, but to try and, for example, reduce the trading costs. So very simple example, instead of using a moving average, I'd use an exponentially weighted moving average, mm. which obviously is more complicated. But that extra step of complexity, what it basically does is reduce the trading costs because it's a smoother indicator while not reducing the, the profitability. So that's an example of where adding complexity to an indicator makes sense but normally i'd be looking for the simplest possible indicator i could get away with yeah cool so you just you in terms of that um those indicators do you actually have your own proprietary indicators or is it all stuff that you've you, you just tweak um you say that you get an sma and you turn it into an ema because of trading costs but is there stuff that you you may you make which is somewhat more pro pro proprietary um if it depends on me about proprietary if you mean like hidden then the answer is no because anyone can download my system off the internet basically right. and if, if they know how to use python they can they can basically just copy it um and if you look at those those indicators um they're, they're none of them are anything kind of fancy and they're all sort of variations on 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 the sort of themes of momentum carry mean reversion I've just seen the name of the person asking that question. That that's that's a hell of a name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so so um, so yeah. That there's there's nothing in there that that sort of would would surprise most people who know about finance and have have, have read you know read, read kind of the the research on it and uh, have worked in in the industry for a while. Um, you know, there's there's nothing in there that that's very complicated um, and, and even if they're indicators people haven't seen before mostly if, if i showed you how it worked you'd go oh is that all <laughs> you know kind of expecting something incredibly fancy and complicated but oh no is that all it does okay yeah, right. well you know it's just knowing how to use that in the right time i want to touch on your element of risk um so would you target a, a sharp ratio would that be something that you would measure your that you would look at your accounting how, how would that come into it so I, i'm going to take issue with your question actually here you go please <laughs> so i measure sharp ratio and and um so sharp ratio is my preferred measure for you know obviously it's a measure of risk adjusted return yeah um of, now it's not a perfect measure um you know no. in particular it assumes that the returns are symmetric which of course they aren't it no. seems that risk is symmetric um, but I also I look at other things as well to kind of give me some color around the sharp ratio. So, I, you know, I know I'm not just um, trying to, um, you know, I'm not ignoring the fact that fact. But what I don't do is target sharp ratio. I don't I don't target return. So, yeah, um, I'm not I'm not I think it's actually quite a dangerous thing for people to to sort of say out front. Right. I want a sharp ratio of two. <laughs> I'm now going to run my back test until I get to that. Um, so so um, I, I target risk, but not return. 
which means but, I also don't you could, target you, chart ratio. But you could you could work within the the denominator, couldn't you? You could work within the volatility and and use that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I target risk, yeah. um, and I I'm, that's what I'm primarily concerned with. Is you know mo virtually if you look at my my system, a lot of it's all about targeting risk. Um, and the return hopefully drops out at the end as a kind of happy, happy byproduct of that. But, but you know, I, I, the first thing you need to do is measure your risk and control it. Yeah, cool. I want to touch on, um, before we go into the mistakes, there's a few, few areas I'm really interested in. Um, in your book, Leverage Trading, um, you focus on account size and um, the ability for people um, to trade in, in smaller accounts. Um Obviously, I think you know some of our clients. That will certainly resonate with them. They're not all hundred thousand dollar clients uh, accounts by any means at all. So, for people who are starting out in their systematic journey, and you know, obviously, everyone should be reading. We could give you a chance to talk about some of the findings that that you have in your book. Um, well, the first point I want to touch on is 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 smallish account size or smaller account sizes. How how do how, how much of a consideration is for people with smaller account sizes when they're getting into this systematic journey? Well, it should be a concern for everybody, regardless of whether they're trading systematically or not, to be honest. Um, I guess the difference is that if you're trading systematically, you can actually kind of quantify and measure the, the effects of having a limited account size. So the main issue with having a limited account size is you can't necessarily trade the instruments you want to trade. So diversification you know, this is a famous quote, is the only free lunch in finance. The best kind of diversification is diversifying and training lots of different instruments. Um, so, you know, if you, you look at the kind of large um, futures funds that I'm effectively, I used to work at, and I'm sort of effectively competing with at the moment, you know, they're trading hundreds and hundreds of markets. Um, you know, large, large companies trading stocks are trading tens of thousands of stocks. Um, now, you just can't do that um, if you have a, well, you could, I mean, I can't do it. My account's, you know, it's sort of mid six figures, uh, my trading account. You can't, certainly can't do it with, with you know, with $10,000. Um, so what you've got to do is, so what's the best use I can make of my limited capital? Um, I want to basically trade as many instruments as I can give my limited capital. Um, and that, that will mean, for example, you know, I trade futures. Futures have got quite big ticket sizes. So, you know, that's not really, you can't really get a diversified portfolio of futures with, with you know, probably $100,000 even is quite low, to be honest. Um, you know, so you, you, you're then looking at um, the other markets like FX, um, spread bets, CFDs, and so on and so forth. Um, please be aware that not all of these may be legal in the jurisdiction that you are currently listening from. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so you, that, that, that's the first thing in terms of choosing what what kind of actual types of instrument you can trade, and then it then comes down to the choice of instruments you can trade. And as a, a kind of general rule of thumb, the more volatile something is, the the less of it you need to hold in your account to get a certain amount of risk. So that means, for example, that um, you know you you probably you, you're going to be able to have a more diversified portfolio. If you've got say a mixture of say G10 and emerging market FX, than if you just had G10 FX, because a lot of G10 FX has got very low volatility, relatively speaking, and so you're not, you know, you you're not going to be able to get as much um, of a diversification with that. Hmm. Um, and and this is a really actually a very complicated um, problem. And I'm actually writing my sixth. So you didn't misread that. I've written six. I'm currently writing six. I've written five blog posts on this subject. I'm currently writing my okay. sixth one. I've written also whole that whole book leverage trading is you know a big theme of it is using a limited amount of capital so it is it's not a straightforward problem and and uh, there are lots of different ways of solving it um, but yeah as a general rule of thumb you want to trade as many instruments as you can and and then try and select um, you know instruments which um, you know aren't going to chew up too much of your capital and is that is that is that over different strategies because I know you know in the CTA world for example in the trend following world if you want to call them that. Um, you know, they, they obviously have huge diversification across. I mean, you know, they don't really care what, what, what they're buying or selling. It's just got to go up really in, in a very simplistic kind of capacity. They could be doing lumber, probably all over lumber last year um, and this year. Um, but yeah, they don't really know. So you get up, you know, diversification just because of the, you know, something going up and, and, and trending. 
But if you're that diversification, we can talk about strategy diversification. But in terms of for, for retail traders, if do you need diversification within mean reversion in, within that strategy? Do you need diversification within trend following? How much diversification would you need? Obviously, that's depending on account size, right? Well, there are there are three different kinds of diversification, right? So there's diversification across instruments, across trading styles, and then within trading styles, um, you've basically got what I would call time diversification. So, um, so ideally, the the best kind of diversification in terms of giving you higher expected risk adjusted returns is diversification across different instruments and ideally asset classes and that is one of the main advantages that, that you have from trading futures or any kind of similar instrument that allows you to trade across asset classes so yeah you can trade lumber you can trade stocks you can trade bonds you can trade gold you can trade bitcoin you can trade milk um you know i've got about a couple of hundred futures in my database so there's you know there's a huge variety of things you can trade um, and as a small investor, you can replicate some of that, for example, by buying ETFs um, that, all, that contract different asset classes or, you know, or by doing other leverage instruments like spread bets or CFDs and so on. Um, now, the, the, that's, the, that's the best kind of diversification, and that's kind of independent of whatever strategy it is you're running. You, know, you, you want to get as much of that as you can. Um, but it's a kind of diminishing return. So once you're trading kind of one of every kind of asset class, you've kind of got one sort of you know, thing that one sort of wheat, you know, agricultural commodity like wheat or corn or so on and so forth, you don't really get a lot of benefit from, as much benefit from adding more to that bucket as long as you've kind of got one of everything to start with. And similarly in, say, stocks, you know, you once you've kind of got reasonable diversification across geographic regions and countries and different sectors, then you don't, you don't get as much value from adding, say, your second Australian mining company if you already own one Australian mining company. Yeah. Um, so, so that that's that that's the best kind of diversification. This the, then you've got diversification across different styles. So, we've mentioned we talked about trend following. We talked about mean reversion. You know, we've also got things like carry. Um, you know, you then you've got kind of more um, asset class specific things like being short volatility. You've got you know equity factors trading like value and growth and so on and so forth. Um, that that's another good for, source of diversification. So, you know the the um adding if you say trading momentum then adding a carry component to that will improve your returns quite significantly um adding a mean reversion again will improve things further um and then and then the within that you've kind of obviously there's different ways of picking up momentum but as i've kind of already alluded to that's not so valuable because they all kind of do the similar kind of thing yeah but you've, also, you've also got time diversification so if you think about say trend following a mean reversion well Trend, trends tend to occur in a lot of assets with holding periods of between a couple of weeks and about a year. And, and then mean reversion tends to happen at different time frames. So it, it's probably not, if you've got something that's picking up one month trends, if you then add three month trends and six month trends and one year trends to that, then that's kind of going to be giving you a bit of extra diversification on top of that. Yeah, nice. Now, the, let me, so very quickly, in terms of small small traders, the way I construct my system, because I kind of um, average everything together, it means that the actual the actual instruments themselves all have their own capital allocated to them, if you like. So I can't add an extra instrument without adding more money to my portfolio, but I can add extra systems. I can add extra indicators, and I can add extra um, styles of trading and extra speeds of trading because those things are not using their own capital, if you like. They're using they're sharing a pool of capital. Whereas if you were to trade all of those systems separately, so they're all kind of firing off their own trades individually, um, then that would chew up more capital. So that's another way of for a smaller trader to get diversification across styles and across speeds of trading. You, you can do it in a way that doesn't necessarily use more capital up. And how does your system, um, before we go into the mistakes, how does your system work in terms of ratios? For example, let's say you've got a, a trending system that's doing x but then you want to like you say you want to sort of beef it up with some carry and that means maybe being along the turkish lira <laughs> you know and the turkish lira has got a, an 18 or 16 percent implied volatility and your other situation has got a, 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 a realized or implied volatility of say eight percent so how would your system do, if it were using those those inputs work on a ratio or a position size adjustment based on that would it be clever enough to 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 do position sizing based on that that volatility 
I, I'm insulted, Chris, by the the thought that my system isn't clever enough to uh, to do what <laughs> you say. It's me. It's me. Yeah. No. So that that's a simple two to one ratio. So um, if you let let's suppose that so that would mean that for the same kind of strength of momentum or carrying or whatever, um, the position size of the Turkish lira would be half. Um, the in terms of capital allocation, the position size in 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 another in the other instrument which has half the volatility. So position would roughly scale with the inverse of volatility. Yeah, and for people who are not so familiar with implied volatility or or realised volatility, for example, can you do can you do the same thing with say an ATR, an average true range? You yeah you can, and actually um, I if you um, so you can actually translate between um, volatility and ATR, and if you you need to make some assumptions if you want to do it theoretically, if you do it empirically, then then you just need to remember one thing, which is the number fourteen. Um, so basically, if you if you get an ATR and you multiply by fourteen, then it's going to give you something that on average works out to being about the same as an annualized volatility. Right. Okay. Okay. I have to try to check that out. You learn something every day. That's great to great to see. I'm not okay. saying it doesn't it doesn't always work, but on average, that's the the the, the factor that seems to translate what quite well between those two numbers. So. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, just a quick one: How many markets do you trade? We've got a question there from Louis. How many um, trade, so at the moment, I'm trading 35, but because I have got this, um, I'm just at uh, this very moment uh, this morning, and I'm going to be posting it on my, on my blog in a few days' time. Um, I've got a new a new way of uh, trading my system that means I'll be able to trade um, well about 120 markets, um, increasing to 200. Um, but the the important point is I won't have positions in all of those markets at the same time because I don't have the capital. Um, so it's it's basically just just a way of dynamically optimizing and and saying well probably on av on average I'd only have positions in say 12 markets out of that 150. Um, say but um, but yeah at the moment it's 35 but it's going to going to go up to well depending on the you know on any given day to short answer on any given day i've got about 12 12 or 15 positions on but the pool of markets though those can come from you know could potentially be much larger would you sell that to a hedge fund if who had the capital would you be able to in in theory i know you probably wouldn't want to give your secret source away because then you they've well I'm, the it's on my blog in it's on my blog in three days i'm not sure that can't counts as secret source really <laughs> All right, fair enough well we'll check it out we'll uh, make sure that people get the, uh, the the blog link in the in the description for this uh, video um let's go into the common mistakes the three common mistakes that uh, traders make um you know as we talked about there you know when people are designing systems that there are a lot of things that people do well, and then there's a lot of things that people do very poorly at different stages of their their life. And in fact, you you say that that people with PhDs do different types of mistakes from from people yeah. who are who are starting out in their journey. Um, so why don't you you take us through? Uh, first of all, start off with, the, with what are what are the three class biggest mistakes, and then we'll go into them in in each one in a bit more depth. So the first two mistakes are made by all traders, and the third one is sort of specific to systematic traders. Um, so the first mistake people make is using too much leverage, basically taking on too much risk. Um, the second mistake people make is trading too frequently. And, and um, the, the way I like to characterize these first two mistakes is the first one blows up your account tomorrow. The second one bleeds your account dry over the next few weeks. So, you know, so pick, pick how you'd like to die quickly or slowly. Um, the And then the third the third mistake, which is sort of specific to anyone who's using a, a you know, a back tested trading system um, is um, is basically overfitting or curve fitting, as, as it's commonly known. Mm. OK, um, well, let's start with uh, too much leverage. And again, I think this probably fits in quite nicely. I you may cover this in in the book as well now we've seen um esma in in europe changing leverage ratios for in in you know retail derivatives in australia that was also recently put in practice as well um obviously if you're pro you and you fit certain criteria you can get higher leverage uh, so this is a, a really poignant point you know i get clients saying oh i can't trade with 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 really really low leverage but you're making the argument that actually you can, and actually it can be better results for you. Uh, yeah. So let, let's keep it really simple and assume we're just trading one market. Um, so what 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 I like to do is say, well, what 
risk do I want to take on my capital? And obviously, as we've discussed, there's different ways of measuring risk as ATR and so on and so forth. But I used uh, this concept of an annualized standard deviation. So let's say I want to take have an annualized standard deviation of 20% a year. And 20% a year is about the kind of risk you get holding the S&P 500. So it's kind of, you know, a level of risk that, that traders should be comfortable with, I think. Um, and the other important point to make is that um, you, if you increase that level, if you say, well, actually, Rob, I'm comfortable taking 100% standard deviation a year risk, um, actually, there's um, some, some kind of theory that shows that as you increase your leverage beyond a certain optimal point, you will actually lose money, even if your underlying trading system is profitable. Um, so 20% is a, and it's better to be conservative than to be, you know, overly aggressive, clearly. Um, because you don't lose that much in terms of, you know, log terminal wealth to get technical. Um, if you um, if you're um, you know reducing your risk a bit, than if you you know to put it on too much risk. Um, so now let's suppose that that we 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 then go out and buy say just the S and P five hundred. Well, we're not going to need to use any leverage, right? Because we we're buying something that's already got twenty percent risk. So uh, the 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 appropriate leverage ratio is is one. You know. Um, that's that's you know we our exposure that we've we've got is going to be the same as our capital, and that's giving us a twenty percent risk that we want. Uh, and if we were to say invest in something a bit wacky like I don't know Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin's vol is is probably about eighty percent a year. Um, so we'd actually only need to commit a quarter of our capital to get that twenty percent risk target. So we'd actually be using less than one leverage so that that may sound weird but effectively what we'd be doing is keeping most of our cash 75 percent or 80 percent of our cash you know un, unused untouched effectively and only committing 20 percent to the to the position we were taking and now let's suppose we're trading um spot fx which and say g10 spot fx which tends to be you know relatively safe so something like cable for example the risk might be, I don't know, 4% a year, say, something like that. You, you probably know the figures better than me, Chris, to be honest. Well, euro dollar is now trading at four and a half is the four and is, a half. Well, is one month implied volatility. Okay, well, let's use, yeah, let's use 4% because the maths is easier, if you don't mind. I'm not sure I can divide by four and a half in my head while I'm on, yeah, on air. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 4%, well, that would mean that, that to achieve our 20% leverage target, we'd need five times leverage. Um, and five times leverage is still well below um what you know that most most people will, will limit you to um with the possible exception if you're trading in the us and you're buying stocks in the margin account the leverage limit there is two but but stocks are fairly risky so that's not an issue so to actually need to use that 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 um the other kind of leverage limits that that people think that they need one of two things must be true. Either the underlying asset you're trading has got very, very low realized or applied volatility. And I'm thinking of something like a maybe like a, a short um, bond, say, a, you know, like a two year bond, bond for example. Um, it's particularly, the you know, when, when interest rates have been very low and depressed, those things have had a very low volatility. Um, but even then, um, you know, you, you, you probably you might be up to 10 or 15 or possibly 20 times leverage, possibly something like that. And to be honest, beyond that, I would actually say, well, actually, I don't want to trade this thing anymore because it, its risk is so low um, that I'm effectively exposing myself to a, a massive tail risk if something goes wrong. And the, the, the kind of classic example of this was, was Euro Swissy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, back, back in in um, in 2016, was it January 2016? 15, I think it was 15, 20, yeah. January 2015. Yeah. So the the um, obviously in, in 2011, I think it was the the Swiss bank said we're going to peg to the euro, uh, 120. I think it was, um, and that meant that the the the, the realised volatility of euro Swissy was was basically nothing um, for a, for a, you know for five years, and then obviously they decided one morning they woke up and thought, well, let's just remove the peg. What could you know? Why not? Uh, and I think that that thing moved by about 20, 25 percent um, in a matter of minutes or seconds even. Um, and, you know, and sometimes in, in finance, we talk about, oh, that was a, a 10 standard deviation or event or, a you know, or something like that. Uh, and I think this was something like a 300 standard deviation event. I mean, it was just, you know, and if you'd had any any leverage on bigger than about four times, say, you would have been wiped, completely wiped out by that move. Um, so. So I, I would say, 
you know, if you need big leverage, it's either because the thing you're trading is has got very low volatility, in which case I'd probably say stay away from it because you you could be in a euro Swissy type situation. Or alternatively, your risk target, this 20% figure I said at the start, is too high. So you're saying, actually, I want three, four, five or six times equity risk, um, you know, in my account, because I, I feel like, and this often happens when people think they want to target a particular level of return, going back to what I was saying earlier, rather than worrying about risk. So they say, well, I need to have 100% return a year, therefore I need to target this level of risk to get it. Um, and as I said, the problem is that that's probably pushing yourself beyond the point of optimal leverage. I guess, um, sorry, just to yeah. interrupt, I just yeah, guess the, the, the concern I've got, well, the concern I would hear um, from someone with 4% leverage um, uh, targeting a 20 vol is that this word patience is something that a lot of retail clients uh, don't have very often and it's something that, that is obviously makes them tr good traders it would make them good traders and i guess this is where systematic strategies come in because the the system would just do the trading and there would be no such word as patience patience wouldn't matter for me as a discretion for for, for me look at discretionary traders that the, the, the the argument for, for 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 automated in this situation is is that they would go right at that type of leverage i would literally get on such a small position even on a 10 grand account or the average you know, average account say 10 grand such a small position that you might have a series of winners and then you're like i need more leverage i need more leverage because i just i'm doing i'm trading well but these position sizing are too small so that would just it would frustrate to the point where they would just go no i can't trade like this even though you're saying it's the right leverage for and, and and they may have a really a, an ex, a high positive expectancy a, you know a, a good curve if they were back testing that but for the argument for 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 automating this is is for me sounds like patience the word patience would be the big situation is that right or wrong yeah i mean it's not even automating and and it, it's it's just about using setting your position and risk sizing according to you know what is theoretically correct rather than what return you fancy earning and actually you know one of the things i discuss in 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 a couple of my books is the idea that you can still be a discretionary trader in the sense of saying i'm still going to use my discretion to say when will i buy euro dollar when will i when will i you know but um or when will i sell cable or when will i do this you can still use the discretion to do that but then the actual decision making around what size position you should have and you know your risk management in that position, your stop loss, those should be systematic. Yep. Not necessarily automated, but they should be systematic. So, you, yeah, you decide when you go into the position, but then you use a, a set of rules to tell you how big the position should be and how long you should hold a position for. Um, so it's perfectly possible to build a systematic system that takes on that uses too much leverage. Hmm. Completely, completely. I could do it myself. I, all I need to do is go into my code now and change the number 0 0.25, which is my analyze vol target 25% a year, I could change that to 250. Job done, you know, easy. <laughs> um, yeah. It's very it's very easy to do that. And, and my back test would look astonishing. I'd, I'd be making, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars um, after 20 years. Um, but I know that would be completely insane. Um, and um, my, my expectation is one of two things happen. There's a tiny, tiny probability I'll get really lucky uh, and make a lot of money there's a much larger chance I will lose all that money. Mm. Um, and it's the 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 kind of understanding and appreciation of that fact um, that even you know, even if even if you haven't overfitted your back test, even if your 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 back test is correct, um, even if you're you've managed to come up with a system that does really well, it's still possible to be unlucky and to have a bad year. And if you have a bad year and you're lev you're targeting 20% a year, you might lose 10%. If you're having a bad year and you're targeting 200 percent a year you're gonna have no money left and and the following year when your you know your system becomes profitable again because even a brilliant system won't make money every year you're not gonna have any capital left to trade with um and that that's the thing that people need to appreciate and i guarantee that most of the people watching this will not have targeted volatility in fact you get a whole i don't know if this is probably a world that you may have worked in in in, in the hedge fund industry but volatility targeting funds and, and they i guess they use a similar situation where they they target a level of volatility and that will tell you how much cash they have in the system so um in your book do you do you explore the idea of, of this con this very concept of, of using volatility as as your as your guide for um for leverage in that situation yeah i do but but it's 
people do actually target volatility, but they may not realize they're doing yeah. it. So, for example, if you're using a if you're committing a fixed amount of your capital to a, a particular trade, that is effectively a form of volatility targeting. If you said to me, oh, I'm 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 putting one percent of my capital in every trade. If you gave me a couple of other facts about your your trading system, I could then tell you, well, actually, that means you're actually targeting a 15 percent vol. Mm. You may not realize that's what you're doing, but that's that's what you're doing. Um, so, so people may be doing it without realizing it. The, dif the difference is that um, if you're targeting, if you're say putting 1% of your capital in, but you're trading 10 times a day, that's a completely different situation. If you're putting 1% of your capital into every trade and you're trading once a week, that first um, system will have a much higher volatility, much higher risk than the second system, even though the percentage of capital committed is the same in both cases. Because obviously, if you're trading many times a day, you can be losing 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, and by the end of the day, you have nothing left. Whereas if you're, if you're committing 1% once a week, then obviously it would, you, you, your risk is over time is a lot lower. And that's why I personally prefer the volatility targeting method rather than the percentage of capital method. But yeah, they are, you can show that they're equivalent. Cool. Well, you touched on frequency then. So do you want to explain your findings on um trade frequency leading to better outcomes yeah so um i think there's the the, the, the the place people come from is they they say right i managed to find a profitable trading system at this level of leverage trading once a week say i can make 10 percent. well the first mistake they make is to say well if i double my leverage i can make 20 percent. and as i've pointed out that may not it's unlikely to be the case um so you've got to watch your leverage but the other thing people then say is, well, instead of trading once a week, what if I trade once a day? Then I'm trading five times more time. So I'll make five times more, right? Uh, or I could trade once an hour or once a minute, you know. So it's kind of the idea that if you've got a say a perfect card counting system and you go to the casino and you you kind of you're sitting at the blackjack table and and um, you know the dealer's being pretty slow and you're only playing one hand every five minutes, you'll make a certain amount of money. If you play multiple hands, the dealer's really quick, you'll make more money. Um, and that is true. That's true if you have got a perfect blackjack card counting system, then in which case probably do that rather than trading, which is a lot harder. Yeah. Um, definitely. Um, and you, you don't get to sip cocktails while you're you're trading either. Although if you're if you're systematic you, you and also you, you, you can you can drink all day if you like. I, I don't, but you can. Yeah. Um, so, so that that's the basic idea. Now, th there's a number of flaws with that. that so, firstly, technically, um, if you double the number of trades you do, you won't. The best you can do is actually increase your profits by the square root of two rather than two. But let's put that to one side. Um, the, the second issue you, you might have is that markets often don't behave in the same way at different time frames. So, trend following works reasonably well with say a one month holding period for a lot of asset classes um, with a two day holding period you're more likely to be looking at a mean reversion system being profitable so that just don't assume things scale like that but the third thing and the, the perhaps the most crucial is the issue of costs so if you're trading 10 times more often then obviously you're you're going to be having 10 times the the costs that, that you would you're trading and you know, costs can either be spreads or commissions or both um, and the, there's an important difference between returns and costs, and that is that we don't really know what our returns are going to be, and there's a lot of luck involved. And so, so it might be that on paper, yes, if you increase your trading frequency, so you're trading, say, 10 times a day rather than once a week, that your profitability on paper will increase by a certain amount. Mm. But the point is that that's, that's obviously subject to the normal issues of backtesting, but also a certain amount of randomness. Whereas if you trade 10 times more often, you will absolutely definitely be paying 10 times more trading costs. You can state that with almost a certainty. You know, trading costs are very easy to forecast and predict. That is not so true for uh, returns. I want to, um, it feeds really nicely into the, uh, into the, into the section of, of the back test because, you know, trading costs, it's a race at the bottom in, in so many markets, whether you're, you know, institutional and, you know, even in retail land now, it's really a race at the bottom across asset classes. Um, when you're back testing a strategy, how do you account for the changes in in trading costs? Because do, do you do you weight them more closely towards where we are now? Because you know, they were significantly higher twenty years ago, um, or is it just the fact that that data is just hard to find? 
Yeah, it's a, that's a really good question. And the data is very hard to find. So, um, you know, at AHL, where I was working before, we had the advantage that, that the firm was relatively old. So, um, you know, it was actually founded in 1987. So um, they've got 34 years now of, of, of trading cost data. So they can actually go back and say, well, what, what were the trading costs in this market in 1991, for example? Um, it's, it's very hard as a retail trader to go out and get that kind of data. So you have to make some assumptions. Um, so there are, there are obviously different ways of doing it. The way I do it is to assume that risk, that trading costs scale with volatility. So the the risk, if a market's riskier, then the trading costs will be higher um, than the, than than they are now, uh, and vice versa. Um, so that means, for example, that you know in March last year, I would assume that trading costs are probably twice what they are now, and that kind of makes sense because you know the market was in chaos. A lot of, lot of market makers weren't really showing quotes. It was a lot, quite a lot thinner than it than um, than it is now. So that that doesn't seem a stupid thing to do. Um, but I agree absolutely. As you go back in time, you were definitely um, probably seeing a shift in trading costs that's not in the data, and that means you have to be really careful. So let me give you an example. Um, if you look at relatively fast momentum, specifically in equity indices, so things like the FTSE, the ASX, the, the uh, S&P 500, it looks like the, the relatively fast trading does very well in those markets up till about 1995. And after that, it doesn't seem to do anything at all. Now, my gut feeling is what's happening is that before 1995, Although on paper, using today's trading costs suggestive of volatility, but scale backwards, it looks like those systems are profitable. In practice, you wouldn't have been able to make profits out of them because the trading costs were actually really high back then. They would have been, yeah. For yeah. Sure. So, so you, that, you've just got to be a bit careful about, because I, I like to backtest with a lot of data because of the speed of trading I'm doing. It gives me a more robust system, and we'll perhaps talk about that in a second. Um, I like to, to back test a lot of data, but it does mean you be very careful about saying, well, this this system on average has done really well. Well, yeah, but for the last 15 years, say, out of 40 years, it, it's done nothing. And, may, you know, we should probably take that into account into our in terms of determining where we allocate our, our capital to different systems. Cool. Well, we've got one more. Let's touch on the last point and then we'll take it to a couple of couple, couple more questions. Um, overfitting. You know, I hear I hear about this so much in in the back testing and i guess that's because it is really important and you've picked it out as one of your your top mistakes so uh, you know talk to me about what curve fitting and overfitting means to you okay so um i'm going to show a picture if that's okay so i'm going to yeah. say to whoever's hosting the technology unleash the slides please unleash the slides unleash the slides there we go okay so this this is um a, uh, a picture from uh, a, a book, not one of my books actually, but a, a book about um, machine learning. But but what this is showing is that um, if you're doing any kind of fitting of uh, a model to data, um, as you make the model more complex, which is kind of moving from left to right on the on the x-axis, um, you can see that that the the prediction error. Obviously, we want a low prediction error. We want to have we want to be doing good predictions, a low prediction error. When we're, as we're adding more complexity to our model, making it more and more complex, the, the model's gonna, gonna fit the data better and better. On this red line here, you can see is trending down and down and down. And actually, you can reach the point where if you make your model complex enough, you can actually get to fit the data exactly. And that means you'll have zero, zero prediction error. <laughs> that's um, a very profitable system. <laughs> and that would be very and so that means basically if you're back testing, the more fitting you do in your back test, the, the more the higher your shot ratio will be. Uh, and that would be fantastic, except of course we don't get paid for back tests. We get paid for no. for actually running with real money. So the green line shows what happens to a, a, a trading system or any kind of model that you're fitting um, in when it's being being sort of um, tested on data it hasn't seen before. And that could be out of sample data in a back tester, it could be when you actually start trading with, with real money. Um, and you can see a couple of things here. The first thing to note is that the green line is always higher than the red line. So what that means is in expectation, um, a, um, a model will always do worse with, model, with data it hasn't seen before than with data it has seen. And that kind of makes intuitive sense. But the other thing to note is that the gap between these two lines is getting bigger as the model gets more complex. So in other words, as we make our model more complex and more closely fitted to the past, 
it's less and less likely to do as well when you present it with data it hasn't seen before, which is what we do in actual live trading. And the, 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 the kind of bottom line here is that that green line there doesn't curve down to zero. It actually is a sort of U shape. And that this the bottom of this U is the point of optimal complexity. So that's where we've got a we've managed to fit our trading model in such a way that the outer sample performance, the performance we're actually trading, is going to be as good as possible. Um, and now the problem, of course, is that that we don't actually know where this the bottom of this green line is. Perhaps you could um, unshare the slides now. 